Welcome, uh, everybody. I think we'll get started. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the first installment of the 2013 NYU Reynolds Social Entrepreneurship in the 21st Century uh, Speaker Series. Uh, my name is Gabriel Broadbar. I'm the Executive Director of the NYU Reynolds Program. And, oh, wow, wow, that, that is really good. Oh, whew. Um, I'm, I'm actually also honestly, no pun intended, um, uh, a big fan of, of honesty, uh, and I'm thrilled to be welcoming back to NYU Reynolds its uh, president, co-founder, and TEO, uh, Seth Goldman. Uh, Seth was first a guest here at NYU Reynolds back um, in 2009 um, when he kicked off the speaker series then, and at the time, Honesty was an independently owned, privately held, values-driven company, and really served as a great example of a for-profit having a positive social impact. Um, and you might be asking yourself, what the heck does a exceptionally tasty beverage uh, have to do with making the world uh, a better place? Um, and I think the answer in part is like a lot of values-driven for-profits, it's not so much about what they produce, although in this case you can make an argument that this is a very healthy alternative in an otherwise very unhealthy beverage landscape, um, but really has more to do with how they do business. Um, Honesty went deep into their supply chain to make sure that 100% of their teas and juices were certified organic. They paid premiums to source uh, from fair trade and certi fair trade certified suppliers. Uh, they also set and met significant emissions reductions each year. They purchased renewable energy credits to further offset their carbon footprint. They hired a diverse workforce. They set up innovative wellness programs to keep the employees happy. And I think they demonstrated a genuine commitment to their community. Uh, everything from Seth's founding of Bethesda Green to their recycling program to getting trees planted all across the United States. These CSR behaviors were genuine. This, this was not greenwashing. And they were good for the customers. They were good for the employees. Uh, they were good for the environment. And lo and behold, they were good for the bottom line. Uh, in 2010, Honesty uh, earned over $72 million in sales. And then in 2011, something very interesting happened. Coca-Cola, which had already owned 40% of Honesty, bought the remaining 60%. Uh, and that raises, for all of us who are interested in social entrepreneurship, a very important question. And that question is, what happens to a legitimately values-driven brand when it's purchased by a profit-driven multinational? On the face of it, in this case, the answer seems to be, thankfully, not very much. And in fact, Coca-Cola might be actually being impacted by the behaviors of, of honest tea. Uh, in any case, I do know that this is one of the important topics of conversation uh, that we're going to touch on today. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to invite um, Seth Goldman up, who's going to uh, uh, have a presentation to kind of bring us up to speed to where Honest Tea is at. Followed by that, Seth and Vanessa Wong, who is an associate editor at Bloomberg Business Week uh, and a very thinker and prolific writer around the food and beverage industry. Uh, we're thrilled that she's joining the conversation today. They're going to uh, have a, a, a conversation and wrestle with some of these questions. And at the end of that, they're going to open up the conversation to all of you. And I encourage uh, anybody who would like to participate to do so uh, by, uh, by asking questions and participating uh, in the conversation. Um, at the end of the event, uh, Seth is going to be signing copies of his new book, Mission in a Bottle. They're going to be for sale over there uh, for 20%. Uh, it's the story of honesty. Uh, it's a really interesting read, and it's also interesting because it's in a graphic novel format, which is really great for people like me who like to read books with lots and lots of pictures. So I encourage you to check that out as well. So uh, without further ado, please join me in very warmly welcoming to the stage, Seth Goldman. Thank you. Thanks very much. 
So I want to talk today about change and where it comes from, how to think about it. And, and I think you'll, uh, you'll hear from me that it comes from a lot of unexpected sources. First of all, let's just reflect, though. Um, <laughs> as you know, one of the entities that's having some trouble changing and adapting these days is the federal government. And uh, I come based in Bethesda, Maryland. It's been a little bit of a weird fall uh, if you're based in DC. Uh, with the furlough and the government shutdown. There was the one uplifting moment that happened last month when President Obama signed the order making sure that the military was going to get paid during the furlough. Uh, they caught a picture of him signing uh, that document. And over on the corner of the Resolute desk here, you see the bottle of honest tea. So um, someone would say, well, you should have just photoshopped in the, uh, the tea to make sure it was placed the right way. And I said, well, that wouldn't have been honest to photoshop it. But uh, nonetheless, it was a, a nice little a uh, way for us to be part of history. And as my wife pointed out, um, should have brought in a coaster. <laughs> um, but actually, it's interesting, because you don't often see uh, brands and presidents. They, they are pretty uh, deliberate about not associating themselves with products. And it was a, I think this was, this was somewhat intentional. OK, so um, I want to um, share with you a bit about how we think about business. In order to do that, it actually starts with how we think about um, our sources. Where, do, where does our product come from? And as you heard from Gabe, we, have, um, we source organic and fair trade tea, uh, primarily from India and China. And so I want to show you a, a short video about a trip I took to uh, some tea gardens in India uh, about 18 months ago. And the first tea garden you'll see is one of the first and really the leading fair trade tea gardens in the world. And they have a school that they've uh, developed with the support of fair trade funds that's really world class. And then the second video is, uh, or the second part of the video, is a trip I took to a, a garden that provides Tulsi. Has anyone heard of Tulsi? A few people? So Tulsi is an herbal, it's actually a basil leaf. It's called holy basil in India. We have a, a product in the back that's called Heavenly Lemon Tulsi. It's one of my favorites. And you'll see here, this community is in a much uh, more basic economic need state. They aren't worried about the quality of their school. They're worried about getting access to power, uh, access to water. And in fact, the power only comes on for three hours a day. And it happened that when I was there, the power came on. So you'll see what happens as a result. At Honest Tea, we always like to stay connected to our ingredients and the communities that produce them. So earlier this year, I traveled to Tamil Nadu in India to visit the Korakunda Tea Garden, 6,400 feet above sea level. Here's the two leaves, one, two, and the bud. Her basket is much more full than mine. Once the tea leaves have been picked, they're weighed and then shipped off to the processing center. Two thirds of the land is still rainforest, which helps explain why there's so much biodiversity. The landscapes in Korakunda are amazing, but the most cherished asset in the community is the school that's supported by fair trade funds. In fact, the school is so impressive that families from surrounding communities try to get their children into the school, even if the parents don't work in the tea garden. We were warmly welcomed and even treated to a local version of the Hokey Pokey. Just for fun, I brought along Stomp Rockets, a toy my sons and I have always enjoyed, and we even managed to get one stuck on the roof. We also visited Bengaluru to learn more about the Tulsi plan. The first farm we visited was four acres owned by a farmer and his wife. The power only comes on for three hours a day in Bengaluru, and it just so happened that when we were there, the power came on. So when the water pump started, it was time to plant the Tulsi seedlings. It took a few tries to learn how to plant the seedlings the right way. Cows roam freely in India, so you have to watch your step. Tulsi is also known as holy basil, and the herb is used in Hindu ceremonies, as seen here with this Tulsi garland. During the visit, our supplier and I cut the ribbon on a new Tulsi drying facility. The farmers can sell freshly picked Tulsi for about 14 cents a kilo, not that much. When they sell it as garlands, they can sell it for 36 cents a kilo. But when they can sell Tulsi as a dried ingredient, they can sell it for $3.70 a kilo. The new drying shed allows the community to capture more than 20 times the value of freshly picked Tulsi. I also met with several dozen local farmers and explained why organics is important to American consumers and a great market for them. 
the opportunity to meet these farmers and learn more about the spiritual role Tulsi plays in their lives made me even more excited to share this wondrous plant with our consumers. All right. Um, so a nice postscript to that um, visit was that uh, at the time I visited that Tulsi community, um, they were only growing 10,000 kilos of uh, Tulsi. And as you know, as for obvious reasons, they weren't making much money on it. But after we set up those drying sheds and I gave them a sales pitch about how we were gonna be really investing in this crop, um, I just met with a supplier last month. They're now up to 100,000 pounds. Um, because when you can, instead of making 14 cents a kilo, if you can make $3.70 a kilo, it changes the way, the way you think about um, what the opportunity is. And a nice sort of postscript postscript is that just last week we announced Honest Tea has just signed a contract with a chain called Smash Burger. It's a restaurant chain, 250 restaurant chain outlet. Um, they're going to be selling uh, and serving lemon herbal tea, Honest Tea's lemon herbal tea, which is our Tulsi uh, product. So you sort of get the, the connection from, that, from where the plant to the supplier to the end consumer. Okay, so 16 years ago, I was working in Calvert Funds in Bethesda, Maryland, at a mutual fund company. I was happily doing it. And if you had told me that I'd still be living in Bethesda 16 years from now, I mean, from then, and I'd be running an organization that was helping to eliminate billions of calories from the American diet, and helping to promote the spread of organic agriculture, and helping to promote fair trade labor standards, I'd say, oh, that sounds like a great nonprofit or a great government entity. What, what's the name of it? I would never have guessed it was a beverage company, let alone one that's now owned by the Coca-Cola company, or let alone one that delivered a 26 times return to its founding investors. But that's what Honest Tea has become. And it has been a most unusual journey. We, the first 10 years felt a lot like we were a nonprofit, not just because of our mission, but because we literally had no profits. We were losing money every year, so it was, <laughs> we needed somebody to fund us. Unfortunately, we found investors who did that. But we really started from the perspective that business needs to change the way it does things. And I'm going to share with you two Chinese proverbs uh, that help frame the way I think about it. So this is the first one. If we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. Well, it's a truism, right? Of course, it, of course that's the case. But where are we going? The United Nations recently ranked the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries, 180, 190, it depends who you're, which ones you're counting, but about 200. And even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, even though we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any civilization has ever had, we're not number one. We're not number two. We're number 40. So what does that say about our society, about our diets, about our lifestyles, about our relationship to the natural world, about our relationship to each other? It clearly means we're in the wrong direction. It's not a sustainable direction. So how do you change that? Well, I'm not placing my money on the federal government to do anything about it. I'm probably not even betting on large corporations being able to do that because by definition, they're invested in the, the direction we're headed. I think nonprofits play an important role, but I really think the change can come, it's a combination, it starts with entrepreneurs who find different models of, of changing that relationship with nature, with each other, and then it happens when consumers invest in that. And they don't invest necessarily with their checkbooks. They invest every time they make a decision about what they're going to buy, what they're going to wear, what they're going to drink, what they're going to eat, how they're going to travel somewhere, what kind of place they're going to live in. I think that's how it changes. And I will be the first to say, and, and it's not easy work, and, and the book that um, we have just put out, <laughs> someone said, this is like a tragedy. The first, <laughs> because every... Every, not just every year, but almost every month, we're on the verge of going out of business. Um, I joke that one of, the, one of the scenes in the book is I um, just had a, uh, just after we made our first delivery of tea, I was at a family picnic having a piece of pizza, and I felt something crunchy in my mouth. I said, there's not supposed to be anything crunchy in pizza. And it, it was my tooth that had cracked. And so I went to the dentist. She says, no, I can tell you, you're grinding your teeth at night. Are you under any stress? <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess you could say that. So well, you got two options. You can try yoga and deep breathing before you go to bed, or I can just fit you for a night guard, and your teeth will still grind, but there'll be that padding. I said, give me the night guard, because I don't sense any you know, chance to relax anytime soon. So I still wear a night guard. Uh, it's still challenging, 
But just as there were people who said, you know, 16 years ago, you can't create a, a beverage company when there's such bitter competition. There are those who say today, you can't build a mission-driven organization inside a large multinational. And to both of those people, I'll, I'll close with this, this proverb that's on the on, wall of Honesty's office. Uh, I'm sorry, actually, just before that, what's the impact of the relationship with Coca-Cola? Uh, when Coke invested, we were in about 15,000 stores. Today, we're in over 100,000 stores. When Coke invested, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. This year, we'll buy over 5 million pounds of organic ingredients. So we really start to change the way people, the suppliers, think about whether they should be organic or not, whether they should be fair trade or not. And to get to my closing um, thought, although people say it can't be done, we say those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted to invite up Vanessa to in, take part in the conversation and look forward to, to your participation as well. Thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so Seth, I thought we would just start out by talking about um, your background in nonprofits. And mm -hmm. I was wondering what you've learned about where nonprofits can be most effective versus a for-profit corporation. Hmm. Yeah. So I ran a nonprofit. Uh, um, what was before AmeriCorps was created, I ran a, a nonprofit in Baltimore um, that was a precursor to AmeriCorps. And um, there were some issues, particularly around poverty, that aren't where the market just can't, can't do that. Uh, so, you know, creating jobs, there's no question businesses can create jobs, but when you're talking about early stage job development, things that um, a business can't necessarily subsidize, the kind of worker training, you know, uh, in the AmeriCorps program, I, we hired a lot of people, this was their first job ever, and a business wouldn't necessarily have the same patience to mm -hmm. um, deal. We had a lot of people who were coming out of juvenile um, uh, services, and mm -hmm. so, the, the kind of training we provided was something a business wouldn't necessarily be able to invest in in the same way. So that was probably a good example of that. Right. Um, so then do you find that um, some of, just in the workplace, finding employees who are equipped with maybe the values or the skills that you need to mm -hmm. further your mission is, is more challenging? In the for-profit? In the for-profit world. Uh, you know, it's getting less challenging. I think what we've seen is, is, is with the growth of organizations like Net Impact, there are more and more students, both undergraduate and graduate, who are really looking for a career where um, their belief system is directly connected to their work. And so while normally that would be the domain of nonprofits, I think uh, people are now starting to see you can do that in a for-profit. And so we, we um, not surprisingly, attract people who, who seek that kind of combination. Um, I think, so to me, it's, it's encouraging to see that there's more people heading this way. Right. Um, and I know, I mean, it's interesting that you, um, you, you've had an interest in social change since a young age, it seems, and you, you chose food and beverage as, yeah. as your vehicle. Um, I was wondering what type of research you did, if any, to to confirm that consumers would care about your mission too? Yeah, um, none. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really starts, so I, actually I should have mentioned that the, the, the catalyst for launching Honest Tea was when I was in New York City. I was um, here for Calvert, I'd done a presentation, I went for a run in Central Park, and then I went to a, a deli cooler, because I was thirsty, and there was nothing there. And I, my friends, what do you mean there's nothing there? Well, there were tons of options, there was just, they all had tons of sugar, or they all had, water or fake ingredients. And I said, why isn't there anything with one or two teaspoons? And I knew that if I was missing it, I couldn't be the only one. Um, my wife, turns out, felt the same way. My co-founder, Barry. And so um, that was still, a, so that's three people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and um, there, was, there was no big research we did. And, and I think um, the reason is because I think the research that big companies do would have, if we had done that kind of research, would have led us away from it. Because they do research and they'll ask someone, which, which product do you like better? And they'll put two drinks. And inevitably, someone's going to say the sweeter one, because it, it tastes sweeter. And like all humans are trained to say, I like the sweeter one. And unless you say, all right, you've just gone for a long run. You want to have a whole bottle of something. And, and you make them drink the whole bottle. And then they say, which one did you like better? No one does that kind of testing. So the, the biggest insight we had was that people weren't asking the right questions. Um, and then from there, we let the marketplace kind of give us our feedback. Right, so um, I guess walk us through how your mission evolved. It sounds like it started with taste. It started with less sweet, right, less sweet um, 
taste profile, and we had some organic ingredients. Um, there were, it was just organic sweetener at the time. And then uh, in 1999, we found a, uh, a wonderful tea from, there was actually uh, uh, a recipe from a Crow Indian, Native American community, um, peppermint leaf, the herbal peppermint. And um, as then we learned a bit about the process uh, for how tea, so tea, both peppermint leaves and tea leaves, are picked and there's never any rinsing. So if you pick, um, the, the Tulsi leaves, was a, that video showed the rinsing, but tea leaves are picked and dried, there's no rinsing. So they're picked and dried, and then hot water is poured on the leaves to make the drink. So if there's ever any chemicals sprayed on tea leaves, and it's you know, herbicides, pesticides, um, those chemicals stay on the leaves until hot water is poured on the leaves, and that's what gets washed into the tea. So we said, wait a minute, so organic actually is, is an, an important way if you don't want to ingest those chemicals or the residues of those chemicals, organic would be a, an important way to do that. So that led to organic. And then as I started to visit the tea gardens, we saw, um, we uh, I think gravitated towards the fair trade ones just because that was sort of our mindset. And then we realized we could make all of our supply chain fair trade, all of the tea uh, suppliers fair trade. And we got to see how they were investing in schools, investing in not just uh, it, it, like what we did in the Tulsi community to help build their infrastructure and economic empowerment. So. It just kept moving that way. Right. I mean, there's a lot going on there. So, I mean, of these different values that you've been trying to promote through your product, which have you found that resonates the most with consumers? The ones with consumers, I mean, I, I, I'd love to say it was fair trade, but it, I can't. Uh, you know, I, we know fair trade has an appeal on college campuses, but I can't quantify it and say, when we went fair trade, I mean, we've been growing, so that's good. I, and I, it's, when, whenever, when it's growing, you, you don't get to just point it to one thing. The one that seems to make the most uh, impact is, is the lower calories. Um, and actually, where, as we look at our business today, the, the fastest growing part of our business is a line called Honest Kids. It's a drink pouch for kids. And so where most drink pouches had 100 calories per pouch, the kind you, you know, the pouch you put in your lunchbox, ours came out at 40 calories. And it's just been, um, just this year, we, we took out all the sugar. We sweeten it only with fruit juice now and it's exploded. And so I think that connects with um, parents looking for help, you know, lower sugar options for their kids combined with organic ingredients. And we know that getting pregnant and having kids is the biggest trigger to people buying organic. So it kind of is a combination of all those things. Interesting. Like I'll have whatever I want, but my kids have <laughs> to have it. the organics, yeah. right? <laughs> um, great. Now, um, I think your, your story about getting uh, the company off the ground was interesting. Tell us who Barry is and yes, how you guys start to mention. work with each other. So Barry is or was my professor from the Yale School of Management. Um, so always pay attention to what your professor says. You never know. <laughs> um, and he's still a professor at the Yale School of Management. And when I was a student, we had done the case study of the beverage industry, and we talked about how there was something missing, but it never sort of led to, oh, let's do some samples. Let's you know try this out. And it was only after that run in Central Park that I got back in touch with Barry and said, I think I'm ready to do something about this. And um, Barry, this was 1997, Barry had just come back from India. He had done a case study of the tea industry and he had actually come up with the name Honest Tea, which for me kind of felt like the clouds parted, it all made sense. But there's a funny story though, when we registered the name Honest Tea, we filed it two different ways. One was Honest Tea, two different words. And then the other was H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And when we, um, after we submitted our application, within a few weeks, we heard back from Nestea, who said, well, you're trying to market a product called Ho Nestea. Um, that, you know, we're not, we're not happy with that. <laughs> and I said, well, gosh, I don't think we're happy marketing a product called Ho Nestea. Um, so we withdrew that application and, and we kept the honesty. So at that point, what did you think about the big soda companies? Well, we were, we were designed to be antithetical to them. I mean, we, we were a response. They were offering the sweet drinks with mostly the same ingredients. We were offering a drink with a, a sixth of the sweetener. Uh, and so uh, there's no question we were uh, brought out as, in, in response to them. Um, our challenge was that they controlled so much of the distribution um, that it was very difficult to gain any shelf space. Right, I think the distribution, I, I don't know, I hope you guys are interested in this, but distribution is fascinating. Yeah. If you see honesty in your grocer's refrigerator, there's a lot of negotiation that <laughs> a is A lot involved. of pain. Too. Yeah, I mean, can you maybe give us like the, sure. the two minute summary yeah. of how that so, works? So initially we made our first delivery to Whole Foods. We had, I brewed some thermoses of tea in my kitchen. We got Whole Foods to take it on, based on those thermoses and then 
we got that order. But then when we wanted to go anywhere beyond Whole Foods, then our challenge began because we'd go to the beverage distributors, the, the, and I, I'm not being sexist here when I say it's guys because it is all now. We went to the guys who distribute Arizona and Snapple and Nantucket Nectars and we said, we'd love you to carry this product and they'd say, it's not sweet enough, it's too expensive, it tastes like grass, it's not flashy enough, whatever, I mean, whatever it was, we were getting rejected. So we had to find other ways to get to those stores and uh, we worked with anybody who had a truck, so like a cheese distributor, corned beef distributor, we, we just put together a patchwork and eventually we got enough shelf space and I want to go back to what I said earlier, why consumers are so important. It wasn't just that we got to the shelf, but that consumers were actually buying it. And so then, you know, and, and so even though the beverage distributor didn't think it was sweet enough, the consumer was looking for that. And that's an important lesson is, you know, your, the middle person doesn't, isn't necessarily your core target consumer. Um, but anyway, we got beverage distributors to carry it, um, but they are challenging folks to work with. And we had to put together, in order to cover a chain like Food Emporium, well, Food Emporium is all in New York, but in order to cover a chain like um, Stop and Shop, we have to be able to deliver not just to New York or not just to Boston. We have to cover all the stores in their network, which means we need a distributor for all those stores. And that could be five or six distributors, each who has their own terms, their own contract, their own pricing they want to make, and negotiating that is very challenging. And some of their limitations could be, you know, they're exclusively distributing for certain brands yeah. and they can't carry Absolutely. another iced tea yeah. brand, right? Totally, So yeah. you'd have to find... A yeah. distributor who had no other barriers. Yeah, we had no competing you know, iced tea Snapple products. Snapple basically tried to lock us out of all their distributors, mm -hmm. and we had some distributors who, you know, I'm thank I'm thankful we're we're gutsy enough to say, well, we don't care what Snapple says, we're carrying on his tea, um, and that if they hadn't come on, they hadn't sort of had the backbone to do that, we wouldn't have been able to get our distribute some of the distribution we got. Right. And in the early, early days, you were just distributing the bottles yourself, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it was painful. Uh, just, yeah, the worst, just the worst. Like, and I, I just to say, like, how bad it is, like, literally, um, there was a case I, I delivered, I had rented a U-Haul truck, and that was a total New York story. I, I came up through New York, delivered to Fairway, Dean and DeLuca, and then the Manja stores personally delivered those. Then I went to Boston in the same truck. Uh, we got an account, uh, made a delivery to Illegal Seafoods, which was really exciting. And I'm like, oh, we're, this is all happening. We're making it happen. And I, I pulled, I was in Harvard Square. And I had the truck. And I'm like, let's go park the, park the truck in this garage. And my, my friend, who was a friend from school, said, no, I don't, you know, I don't think we should park in this garage. I'm like, well, why not? He said, well, it says eight-foot clearance, and you got a 10-foot truck. And just to show you how entrepreneurs think themselves, I said, I think we can make this. <laughs> and sometimes eight feet really is eight feet. And, right. You know, <laughs> This man told a U-Haul to get you your beverages. So. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, I mean, some startups are um, conceived with the goal of being acquired at some point. But you guys, that wasn't ever really. You know, to be honest, we just didn't know. We really didn't. I mean, our, our original business plan is on our website at honesty.com. And there's no discussion about like what's going to happen. It was just like, we're going to try to build this brand that's going to be an alternative, that's going to stand for something that is different than what's out there. And not just in beverage, but in business. Um, you know, a product that is what it says it is, a business that does what it says it will do, or try, or at least be honest if it's not. And um, <laughs> no discussion about distribution or production, which turned out to be pretty important. Um, but it was just this idea that we're going to build this. And, and one of the best pieces of advice I got was from our board member, Jeff Swartz from Timberland. He said, just build it like you're going to own it forever and, and, and good things will happen. And then you figure out how to handle it. Right. And it was very important for you and Barry to have at least some stake or, or a controlling stake in the business for yeah. a long time, even though investors had offered a lot of money, yeah. but less control. I still have my, a stake. I'm, most of my uh, equity, when Coke bought the company, I said, well, I, I, you know, I'd still like to run it, but if, if I'm gonna run it, I still need to feel like it's mine. And I still do feel like it's mine, and I still run it that way. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just a different level of, um, not just focus, but sort of, uh, I, <laughs> it, it's also economic. So like when we, when we decide we're gonna spend something, I still feel like I'm spending my money, which I, I know I spend better than corporations, you know, more efficiently than corporations spend. Um, but also when we think about branding decisions, like is this, is, am I going to be having that, am I going to make that kind of statement about what we do? Right. How did Coke find you guys? It's fun. So um, they, they had created a group called Venturing and Emerging Brands, which was designed to in, identify and invest in and build the next billion dollar brand for Coca-Cola. And the goal wasn't to buy the companies, it was to invest in them. 
So they had done a, a, a scan of all, I don't know, like 3,000 beverage brands out there. And they said, which are the ones that are most promising? And then they got to 20, and then they got to seven, and then they got to one. And we were that one. And so they reached out and said, hey, would you be open to a conversation? And we were actually at the point where we knew we needed to raise some money. This was 2007. We weren't sure how. And we were also seeing some challenges with our distribution where we were getting um, national chains like Safeway that wanted our product, but we didn't have the, the distribution to cover it. And we realized, you know, if this keeps going, we're going to hit a wall. We're not going to be able to reach the people we want to reach. So it was a, a good con coincidence of, of their seeking an opportunity and us recognizing we needed a strategic partner. Do you know what the other brands were that you were up against? Well, no disrespect the, to them. The others, um, you know, I don't. I don't. Um, I, we, you know, what's interesting for us, and we tell it in the book, is that we had actually been approached by other companies before Coca-Cola, uh, one of which was Nestle, which sells Nestle Waters. And, and um, we didn't quite get to the place. They were, they were interested in more of an acquisition mode than an investment mode. And so we didn't get to an agreement about it. Right. Um, and there was some concern that since they already had an iced tea brand, that they would try to mold your brand to fit their values, right? Yeah, um, and that's you know that's always a risk. Um, but we, you know, that was one reason it was important for for me to feel like we weren't selling, but we could take in an investor and keep our control. Right. And so, um, tell us about how the negotiations worked with Coke. What did they, when they approached you, what did they offer you, and what, what did yeah. you have to really fight for? So, this is kind of funny. Um, basically, because we just had the conversation with Nestle, when, when we first had the meeting, they came to our office in Bethesda, and I, even before then, I just said, well, um, actually, no. So, we met, we had a nice conversation, and then um, one of the vice presidents invited me with my sons to go watch the Red Sox. This was 2007, play in, at Fenway. In the, world, in the playoffs, it was leading up to their rise. I was a big Red Sox fan. And my sons are huge Red Sox fans. And so we, we go up to Boston. And first, just to set the stage. So if anyone's been to Fenway Park, you're walking through like, it feels like you're walking through your grandmother's basement. It's kind of musty and dark and mildewy. And then you get out to the field, and it's beautiful. And we keep going until Coca-Cola seats are literally right above the Red Sox dugout. And my sons are looking at me like, this is amazing. They got their gloves. They're ready to go. In the first inning, the, they're against the Cleveland Indians. The Indians go down one, two, three. And on the way to the dugout, Kevin Euclid, uh, the first baseman, tosses a ball to my son. And <laughs> like, I think they just closed the negotiation. <laughs> but but and the guy said, oh, yeah, we had to pay Kevin a lot of money to do that, which, which they did. But, but, but at that game, uh, while we were enjoying the Red Sox, actually, they lost that game. It was still fun. But at the game, I just sat with this, this guy, and we, I said, I wasn't negotiating. I said, you know, here's why we didn't do the deal with Nestle. They wanted to buy the company. And we kind of talked out the terms, and it wasn't like I was dictating. I just said, here's what, I, here's what works. What you did know, you say? Which, so I said, you know, we, we could sell 40% of the company, but I have to keep running it. Uh, we need at least three years to give us uh, enough time to feel like we're developing our own brand at, to scale. Um, we, you know, we will give you the option to buy the company after those three years, um, but that's, that's the structure that I'm open to. And so he said, actually, that works. Now, obviously, there's a lot of negotiation about what's the price on the first 40%, what's the price on the second piece. That we didn't talk about in, in, in any you know, specific way, but those general terms are what we agreed to, and that's what happened. Great. A lot can happen at a baseball game, right? <laughs> well, it was, it was smart of them because obviously I was in a, I mean, I didn't, it didn't change what I wanted, but it certainly was a relaxed mode. It wasn't like we were sitting, you know, face to face at a negotiating table and there were other players there. My kids obviously totally were focused on the game. So they weren't like, they had to ask for this or that, you know, they, was, <laughs> they should have said, they would have said, ask for these seats. <laughs> and what did he say to you that made you feel like honesty's values wouldn't be compromised? Yeah. Well, first of all, there was no guarantee. But um, uh, they said, you know, we, we see a lot of big trends happening. And they talked about health and wellness, environmental responsibility, and corporate responsibility. And they, they showed me a, a pictogram, actually. And they talked about these big mega trends. And they said, there's an area in the middle where all of those fuse together, where, where companies that make decisions that try to incorporate commitments to all of those issues at the same time. It's a small space. But if you look five years out or six years out, we believe that's going to be the standard for how business is done. And it's our belief that Honest Tea is operating in that space. So our investment is more than just an investment in a tea company or an organic food company or fair trade or low calories. It's an investment in a different approach to business. And that's what the investment was about. Gotcha. 
But there were no guarantees. You just had to take them at their word and hope well, that. Um, yeah, because they were a minority investor, um, they didn't have. They couldn't tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't have said, "All right, well, sweeten up the drinks or tea, you know, make it with powders and syrups instead of tea." So that wasn't an option. And I knew if we could grow in those next three years aggressively, then we, you know, this kind of the best defense is good offense. The more powerful we make the brand with those equities in, embedded, the more enduring and the, the less temptation there'll be to change it. And how much have sales grown since 2008? So, so in 2007, the year before they invested, we were 23 million. This year, we're on track to do 111 million. Um, so fivefold, basically, um, with you know, I'd say a more fast growth ahead. We're just 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 this month now starting to meet with national restaurant chains. I mean, larger, you know, the, sort of the five largest restaurant chains in the country. So we think about how to get this product. We talk about democratizing organics, getting our product. Not just, we love the Whole Foods, we love the natural food co-ops, and we love New York City, but we need to get this product not just to the, those kind of markets. We need to get it everywhere beverages are sold. And so now we start to see uh, the potential to make that happen. Right. Um, and I guess as, as the brand has grown, have you found that there are any aspects of your mission that you realized aren't really as important as you thought they were, or hmm. learned that there are other things that, you know, in, in the organic, healthy beverage world, you should be paying more attention to? Um, you know, for us, it's a, it's a continuous process. So um, we started, you know, when we made the first fair trade tea in 2003, but it wasn't until 2011 uh, after Coke bought the company, we were able to make everything fair, all the teas fair trade. So, so it's just a, a journey. I don't think we've made any backwards progress. Um, some have happened more quickly than others, uh, for sure. We just launched, this is, uh, we, we um, so by the way, we just released our mission report, our annual discussion of our impact, and that's on our website. Um, but one of the things we did last year was kind of a, a first, uh, in 2004, everything was organic. Last year, for the first time, um, since then, we brought out something that wasn't organic. And so, you know, why would we do that? Um, but it was a line called uh, Honest Fizz. It's a zero calorie, naturally sweetened soda line. And the reason we made it not organic um, was because the costs were so off, we would have had to make the super premium product. How much would it have cost? So, Honest Fizz is, retails at $5.99 a six pack, or basically a dollar kit. It's naturally sweetened. It would have had to be at least $7.99. And that changes it from being an everyday affordable item to economically exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, we did make one of the varieties, the root beer, organic, and that's actually the top seller. Uh, and I expect by the end of 2014, we'll be able to make the rest of the line organic. So for us, it's just, you know, do you see a path to keep going uh, toward, you know, realizing your mission? It's interesting that the difference of a dollar can uh, influence. Well, five ninety nine to seven ninety nine, so yeah. two dollars, and you spread mm -hmm. it, and it just it changes the way people think about. Well, is this a dollar a can, or is it a dollar fifty a can, or a dollar forty a can? Uh, you know, so it, it takes it out of the um, accessibility. Right. Will there be a point where the supply chain or the efficiencies will allow it to be an everyday well, product? That's yeah. the hope. That's the hope for sure. I mean, you know, just like with tea, we we have we have to build the supply chain. You can't. Push a button, all of a sudden it's there. Right. Um, and so, what pressures, I guess, financially or otherwise, have you faced now that you are wholly owned by Coke? Mm -hmm. So every year we have targets around volume, which is the number of bottles we sell, around margin, which is how much we make per bottle, and then around operating income, that's how much the whole company makes. And so, if we hit those three goals, I mean, there's there's always pressure to hit those goals, uh, but as long as we hit those goals, then we just set the next target for next year. So this year we're gonna beat our targets on all three goals. And as long as we do that, there's really little temptation on anyone's part to mess with it. Um, not just because we're doing well, but the beverage industry is challenged, right? If you look at where the sales trends are, soda's not growing. Uh, a lot of other um, people are moving away, not just from, from soda, but they're also moving away from diet soda. And so um, we're, we're an exciting um, growing area. And so the pressure is just, yeah, we got to meet a business plan. But to be honest with you, well, I hope I'm being honest with you the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for the first 10 years when we were an independent company, if, if we didn't hit our targets, you know, who's, then how do we survive as a company, right? Um, because then the, you know, I go have to go to investors. We, we ran out of money. And the investors say, well, you're not hitting your targets. I'm not sure I want to invest. So it's always been, there's always been pressure to, 
to be able to, to uh, grow. And you know, fortunately, we've picked not just an area that's, that's something I can feel good about, but it's where business is headed. Do you have more of a cushion now to make mistakes? Um, yeah, yeah, we've made some, yes, we've made mistakes on products. We've launched products that haven't worked um, and, and they haven't taken us under. <laughs> we had some situations earlier on where we made bad decisions where we almost went out of business. So, um, you know, part of our job is still to keep innovating. And, mm -hmm. and there's a little bit more, as long as we can make the case for it, there's a little more patience. Yeah. Not to bring up bad memories, but can you tell us a story about a product that didn't work out and why? Yeah. Um, we had a tea bag line. We thought tea bags were, you know, we sell honest tea in bottles. A lot of consumers, oh, I'd love to make this tea at home uh, hot. So that made sense. And we thought, well, if we're going to do it the honest way, we need to have a different kind of tea bag. So it was actually a tea bag made entirely of tea bag paper. It still had a handle, but it was all tea bag paper. So it was microwavable, compostable. Uh, but we found people didn't really care about that. So uh, it just didn't, it didn't sell. Um, we, we tried to reinvent it several times, and that, those, that didn't sell. And um, it didn't take the business under, but it was like we wasted a lot of time and energy. And then we realized, actually, it was, hel it was helpful to make us realize, you know what, we're not, the, the word tea isn't the big, most important part of our name. It's the word honest. And that's much bigger than tea. That's, that's about uh, authentic, organic, lower calorie, healthier products. So that, then all of a sudden you think, okay, then you got honest aid, honest kids, much bigger, even honest food, honest snacks. Mm -hmm. um, and how much had you invested into that product before the you... The tea leaves? Yeah. It was several hundred thousand dollars, not millions, but mm -hmm. you know, for a small company, when you're, you've got salespeople and, and operational people worrying about that, then they're not worrying about selling the main product. Did you hear it from your investors? No. Nah, no. You know, they understand. Look, they, they want you to try new things. Every company I know, and this goes back for, certainly for us, but it, vitamin water too, it, you know, the first product you sell is not the one that gets you across the finish line. And so how do you evolve it? How do you uh, evolve it? And, and you know, um, vitamin water is a great example. When they first started, they, it was all zero calorie, like fruit water. Um, it wasn't that, what, that product that sort of made them as big as they are. I think fruit water is back, isn't it? Fruit water is back fruit in a different water. way. That's a different topic. But, and, and, and so, you know, they had a soy water that was not very good. They had an, an energy drink called Go-Go. It was just weird. I mean, you know, but like us, we, we brought out all kinds of things. We had a, we had a, a cocoa, a brewed cacao drink that was interesting. Uh, it's probably the best way to describe it. That didn't work. We had a kombucha line that, that we liked, uh, but, you know, had regulatory challenges to it. So. Gotcha. And so how has the culture in your own office changed? You guys are in the same office yeah. in, in Bethesda yeah. now, right? Yeah, so, and I'm delighted we have two of our uh, marketing stars, Frank and James, in the back here. They've been with Honest Tea for, uh, they, you know, <laughs> um, they've been with Honest Tea for, for quite a while. They're still, you know, doing what we do, which is uh, most of the, the senior leadership in the companies is pre-Coca-Cola. Um, and so it's, it is our own culture. It's our own um, uh, way of doing things. And so it, it is, uh, our, our office is all open space. Our office is probably about as big as this room, um, but there's no closed, there's no, you know, there's, there's two conference rooms, but other than that, it's just all open space. So that supports transparency and a lot of communication, uh, certainly a little less formal than most offices. Um, and your head counts remained about the same, yeah, right? Yeah, we're at about 120 people. And uh, we got up, at one point we got as big as 140 people or 137, but, um, or 100, I'm sorry, 127, 130 people. So um, the, the big uh, expansion for us, every summer we hire interns, by the way, we love, uh, we have college and uh, MBA interns who work and do our marketing in the summer. So we hired, last year we heard, hired 40 interns. Um, so that takes a big expansion, but then it goes back down. All right. And um, I mean, we, we, we spoke earlier and it sounds like you have a lot of autonomy still. Yeah. Um, you know, how often do you have to communicate with yeah. the guys Well, at I communicate with Coca-Cola every day because there's always some sales or marketing opportunity we're working on. But in terms of formal routines, once a month we have a check-in. We look at the business results. We share the results. Um, and I'm, I go to Atlanta probably, you know, four times a year for some meeting or some, you know, <clears throat> relationship building thing. Um, so it's, it's pretty light. It's not any more intrusive than when I had an independent board. Mm -hmm. um, and what, I guess, has been the biggest advantage of yeah. being owned by Coke now? What it's, it's access, right, to customers, to distribution that, you know, I, 
to think about where we were at 15,000 and go to 100,000, to be talking to these restaurant chains, even to be in universities. Colleges and universities was always a struggle because most campuses, I think NYU is not the case, but most campuses are either Coke or Pepsi campuses. And so we know students, you know, if you give them the choice to buy something that's organic or fair trade, um, they're going to buy it. But until we were part in the mix, a lot of the, the students didn't have options. They didn't have the access to these things. And, and so that to me is, like how, how, how come the customer isn't allowed to choose what they get? And so now at least we can be part of that, and that's, that's fun for us. Had you tried to get onto campuses sure, in the past? Sure, sure. You know, I, I, University of Maryland, where we're based, there's a Pepsi campus. And, I, and so the student group, the, a vegetarian group, had lobbied to get on his tea serve there. And, I'm, and they said, no, they can't because Pepsi. I said, well, tell Pepsi to sell all, you know, let, let them sell all the uh, organic fair trade Pepsi products they have, which is none. And it's like, well, that but didn't matter. Didn't matter what the students wanted. They still, uh, don't get me started. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess on the flip side too, what has been the most um, negative impact uh, you've seen? Yeah, you know, every once in a while, and actually there was an interesting case here with, at NYU um, where we get lumped in as part of the evil empire. So, so uh, I guess it was just in 2008, just after Coke had invested in Honesty, there was a group of students at NYU who were upset about um, Coke uh, had some problems with labor standards in Columbia, one of the bottlers. And um, so this group at NYU called for a boycott of all Coca-Cola products. And so technically, Coke was a minority investor in Honest Tea, and we were banned from campus. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait how does that work? But anyway, I said, so I, I actually you know, tried to engage um, both the, dining, the cap, dining services and the students. I said, you're concerned about labor policies in, in, in the developing world, and you're, th you're throwing out the only fair trade certified bottled tea? And instead, you're bringing in, a, it was a case, this case, they brought in a bottled tea from Japan, brewed in Japan that had a carbon footprint, you know, literally shipping liquid from Japan with no labor standards, no organic standards. Um, so that was just kind of weird to feel like we were on the opposites. You know, we were on the, I was arguing with active, I, I consider myself an activist and I was sort of arguing with them, or at least I was engaging in a discussion <laughs> with them. So that, that's, that can be a little, um, create some interesting moments. Right. Were you able to get honesty back on campus? Uh, I don't before? know that I personally did, but eventually the uh, it was a you know I think maybe the students felt they had made a statement and then you know we came we got back in. Gotcha. Good. Um, and so what? And I don't know if you've done research on this, but what share of consumers do you think choose honest tea because of your values versus oh it's just the delicious tea? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I know we're growing. Um, I know that um, a lot of consumers don't really think organic is a meaningful term. They actually think natural means more. Organic is a federally enforced standard. Natural doesn't really mean anything. Um, at the end of the day, I, um, though I wish everyone sort of could sort of understand our total commitment and all the things we do, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't matter. I, if people buy this product only because they think it tastes good or only because it helps them meet their nutrition or health goals, then we still know what goes on. We still know what the impact it has. And I always look at our impact. So um, our challenge is, in fact, to, our, I think what we're working on now are marketing messages that don't talk about organic or fair trade. It's actually talking about why this product makes you feel vibrant, how it helps you connect to the natural world in a different way. So in a way, our marketing will probably steer, not steer, not steer away from an organic because we don't value it. We'll always value it, but, but we have to make messages um, and themes that connect with people uh, wherever they are, and most of them aren't there yet. Have you um, encountered any like backlash against uh, do-gooder um, activism in you know, the corporate world? Um, it's, e it's tempting to do that. And that, to me, is one reason why our business results are so important, you know? So, so going back to the earliest days, you know, we never wanted Honest Tea to be um, just a model for change. We didn't want to just be a niche product. We always wanted to get this into mainstream channels because if we sort of only become a niche, then we don't inspire others to follow. We don't inspire entrepreneurs to follow. We don't inspire investors to follow. And we don't inspire big companies to follow either. And so what's been really neat for me is that um, as a result of our success, we've now, I've been to um, major corporations to talk about what we're doing. 
and it's, sometimes it's a sales pitch, but other times it's just sharing. And um, as long, you know, success speaks more powerfully than inspiring words. So I can go out and I can talk and, and you know, passionately about it, but when we can show our business results, that's more powerful than any of those other things. Um, has Coke approached you at all to um, uh, help it evolve its own core products? Um, I mean, you seem to be the guy who knows how to take a everyday product and make it more sustainable. So They're doing a lot. They're trying to do a lot. And, and so certainly around packaging. And so what we'll do is try to encourage them. Coke has this technology, a plant-based uh, plant bottle that is a renewable material that is recyclable. And so when we see something like that, that they develop themselves, we, we'll say, this is really exciting. We want to be part of this. Or, or we did a big recycling campaign, uh, actually in New York City, actually in Union Square. Um, and uh, you know they saw that, and so that's that's exciting. Um, so I think they see a lot of you know where people are headed and, and are trying to get there too. Great. Um, I guess just since we're at NYU, I was wondering what you thought was the most important takeaway you took from from business school. Mm. What what did you learn there? What you know can students really try to make sure they don't <laughs> leave out of their well? Education certainly, one here? is pay attention to what your professor says. Uh, by the way, and Barry, you know, I, <laughs> I was. Um, Barry and I got along very well, but it wasn't that I was just a cheerleader for him. I, I actually had some pretty good arguments with him. Uh, not arguments like I'm mad at you, but arguments like, well, I don't agree with that, you know? And that was where I think we developed a mutual respect for each other. Um, the other thing that I did was I did a business plan. I wrote a business, uh, it was separate from my coursework, but I, my, a classmate and I wrote a business plan. And now I know they have courses about business plan writing. And so going through the process of writing a business plan, presenting it, and, and um, uh, that's such a wonderful um, experience, not just educationally, but to understand if you have an appetite for this, do you like to think about the whole business? Uh, is that, um, how, did, how are you energized by it? Which I was. It wasn't a, a beverage um, business plan, but it was something that really got me excited. So it helped me understand that I, I was going to be doing something entrepreneurial at some point. Um. <laughs> we'll open it up to Q and A now. Great, great. Anyone have a question? Right there. I'm close to the mic, so I'll start. Great. Kathleen Apple Tower. Um, one of the concerns with one of the criticisms that you sometimes hear in connection with things like organic certification and fair trade certification is that it pushes out some of the smaller farmers who don't have the skills or right. savvy or ability to meet those certification standards. So what does Honesty do to work with those mm -hmm. so that the small farmers and the, the poverty people are pulled into this chain? Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, that's a good question. Well, so we were, you know, especially let's talk about tea because that's certainly the thing we buy the most of. Um, it is true that um, there are some small tea uh, growers, but for the most part, they really are large communities. Uh, we really, when we partner with a community, it's with a village. It's not just with like one person who has their own plot. Um, and, and, and it is a frustration or a challenge. If you know a source is organic or fair trade, I mean, obviously a, a gardener who owns his or her own plot, what could be more fair trade than that, right? That's the ultimate definition of uh, empowerment, economic empowerment. Um, I think certainly in the United States, you know, it's it's a little diff different where you can support local and um, in in uh, overseas, where we see the people who choose to be organic or not, it's often more just a matter of the economics, it's saving money um, because organic is an investment. It's a longer term investment in 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 um, how you're going to produce your your plants. So I don't feel that um, by us insisting on organic with tea, we're we're eliminating. Um, there just aren't, tea is not a, a crop that lends itself to small micro, not micro farms, but small farms. Um, both the, 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 the because the, every tea, every tea bush uh, grower has to have a, a drying facility within proximity. And so you're really talking about villages. So that's a question of, well, then does the village, are they going to invest in organic or not? Um, not necessarily ruling out the small entrepreneurs. Um, in the United States, it's true we don't, source from uh, local as much. But I, I think I, the only, and I'm not, I, I realize I'm not giving you a, I'm not giving you an answer that may satisfy the concern. I'm not, I'm, I'm admitting we don't support local farmers in the same way. But I do think, you know, there was an article in the New York Times Magazine a few years ago criticizing organic 
for not supporting local. And, um, and, and it, those are two different things. Not, neither one is, I'm not making a judge, well obviously we, we've invested in organic because as a national company, it's not, I don't think it's realistic to say you can um, be local uh, in the same way. So for us, our choice to invest in organic, um, it, it supports a uh, approach to the ingredients that's not necessarily approach about locality. I, I don't know, maybe that's not a good answer. But. I can, well, I just, um, yeah. it was more the question of do you help any of your suppliers, particularly in low-income countries, to work up to those standards so that they can participate? We work, we help them get to fair trade. Uh, but if they're not organic, we can't work with them. And I know that's, on the one hand, we're leaving out communities, but it's like we have to make it, we have to have a, um, we have to make a decision. And, and so for us, we know it's aspirational. We know when we are organic, more communities, um, where they see our growth, they'll say, okay, well, if they're, if they're on the, if a bubble, which one should I be? We're gonna, we're helping bring them that way. And we're, the same with, or, with fair trade. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I teach marketing, and I am so glad that you talk channel distribution because I have no idea how to make it exciting. Uh, <laughs> but thank you. My question has to do with what do you see as far as innovation in packaging? Mm. Um, and, and I'm really thinking of two things. You mentioned a little bit about the soy-based bottle. Yeah. But also the European Union um, whole change of the way they're looking at um, after use yeah. of product. Yeah. What, what, can you just elaborate sure. what you're seeing? Sure. And, and will it change the way your product is perceived on a market ship? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, by the way, it's not a soy-based bottle. The, the Coke bottle is made of the residue after sugar cane oh. is made. So um, just because I know there's some issues with GMO, so it's not soy-based. Um, packaging is really evolving quickly and I, in, a, in a good way. And, and um, so you're seeing stuff out there now like um, there are some prototypes for edible packages. You know, that to me is the ultimate, right? You take the product, you <laughs> drink the liquid, and then you eat the package. I mean, can you, there are, so there are some, it's not gonna happen to us anytime soon. Our challenge is our product is, is pasteurized at 190 degrees, so right. very hard to create a structure that's gonna be able to both withstand that heat and then be uh, not just, I guess, digestible as opposed to what it tastes like. And shipping. Yeah, so, so, so here's an interesting thing with shipping. Um, there, where the technology has evolved a lot is towards much better lightweight technology. And so why is that important? Because we're shipping, so much of our freight is around shipping. Right. And, and we have glass and plastic, and so most people assume, well, the glass is your more sustainable option. But the fact is glass is seven times heavier empty than plastic. Um, and so that means we can fit 18% more product on a truck when it's in plastic. Um, and then the step is, okay, well, we're in this bottle. Um, what can we do to lightweight this bottle? And so a few years ago, we found a way to, to lightweight this by 22%. And we got, it's, it's a little uh, ironic, we actually got criticized because in order to do that, we had to put in a, a bell, a dome underneath to create pressure. But when consumers saw the dome, it's a little bit like when you buy potato chips and there's this bag of, you know, a lot of air in the bag. So, we, oh, you're just selling me air. Well, we didn't change the, the liquid volume of the bottle, but it did create an impression that somehow was a hollow bottle. Um, so I mean, there was a case of a challenge. I think um, in the very long term, if I look 10 years, not very long term, 15, 20 years out, I actually think there'll be a, a lot less shipping around of packages. And what I think will happen, if you think about what's going on with the Green Mar Mountain Keurig systems, and you think about what's happening with SodaStream, where you can sort of make drinks at home, I think there'll be some kind of a combination where instead of uh, going to the store and buying um, bottles that you take home, you will be buying cartridges of uh, flavors that you can put into a system and make drinks at home. I think though, with a product like ours, which is tea, we know this product can't be, um, we brew it, it's real brewed tea, it's not just sort of a powder or a syrup, so it's a little more challenging for us. Um, and then finally, the, 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 where people are, are moving toward is, it's not about, um, it, it's, it, you always wanna reduce your size, but how, what's it, the efficiency of the package? And so the way we evaluate a package is to look at what percent of it is the package and what percent is the product. So the glass bottle, 70% of the weight of that package is the product, 30% is the package the bottle. This product is 90% liquid, 10%, and then our Honest Kids pouch is 97% liquid and 3% pouch. Now the pouch isn't recyclable, so that's a problem. Mm. So anyway, these are some thoughts, but of course the, the other challenge is only 35% of uh, all packages are recycled in the, in the U.S., and we've got to change that, and that's what our great recycle campaign was about. How do we get people to think about their packages differently? Thank you. Sure. Hi, I'm from Bethesda previously, and oh, nice. um, 
No, but that's Green from Great. some work there. So my question is kind of tying into your past where you came from education and looking at some of the small companies that are coming out of Bethesda Green, you're interested in that. So I'm interested in doing educational entrepreneurship mm. and it's this where, where you really meet students in the classroom and you help them get job experiences and things like that. It's not a, a product per se. So I, I'm really curious how you see opportunities for, for an industry like education to have an impact like what you're able to do with the product which is honest tea yeah. and how like something like Bethesda Green might, might work to support that. Well, I mean, you know, distance learning is incredibly powerful. If you can get um, the right uh, educational, to give people the right educational tools and make it accessible to them, that's transformational in people's lives. So it's not as much, I mean, the environmental impact is you're, you're, you're not necessarily moving people, you're reaching them wherever they are. Um, but if you can, can connect with people, there's incredible economic empowerment um, that can happen. So how do you make it accessible, meaning how do they have the access to the technology? And then once they have the access to the technology, how do you make the learning um, impactful? And, and this is not directly related, but for us, one reason we wrote the book the way we did is because we wanted to reach people who weren't going to be the standard business book readers. You know, If this were just a textbook uh, or written like a textbook, you may get it assigned in class, but you'd be very unlikely to just pick it up because you like reading pictures. Or um, even more, if you brought it home and put it on a coffee table, tea, let's say a tea drinking table, as opposed to coffee table, <laughs> um, your kids would be unlikely to pick it up and read it because they're not going to read a textbook. But a comic book, oh wow, wait, what's this about? And so, so how do you make um, any? How do you make things more accessible? And we talk about democratizing organics. How do you democratize knowledge or access to knowledge, yeah, which obviously can lead to empowerment? Hi, my name is Samuel. I've seen your website and I was really impressed Thank with you. attributes um, like design, um, tea nutritional details, and your, your blog. Um, as a natural follow-up, why don't you just create an a, a honest tea app? Because um, people usually spend more time in apps rather than um, mm. just searching a website for a beverage. Yeah. Yeah, so, and I think that this app might give people an added motivation to um, buy beverage from Honest Tea when they're surfing your flavors. Hmm. Yeah, and also another question is that, um, uh, one question? Um, uh, uh, important questions? <laughs> okay, so what's your most instructive failures um, yeah. when you're doing this, um, building this top selling? Yeah. Um, Tea brand. Thank, so thank you. Thank you for the idea about the app because um, we, we always are trying to find ways to engage people and make things relevant. And we do tweets and we have our Facebook page, um, but we're always, you know, how, how can we use the digital to, to bring more people to the drink? But the biggest failure um, by far, in my opinion, was we had a bottling plant that we owned for six years. We co-owned. And um, all of the scariest parts of the book are related to the bottling plant um, because it was, it was, we lost more than a million dollars. Uh, in the investment, we it was a huge distraction. I was it was in Pittsburgh. We're in Bethesda, about four hours away, and I was driving there every month. Uh, and all of my not all, but so much of my energy and uh, time and, and emotion were invested in the bottling plant, and that didn't build the brand at all. It was a total distraction, and, and it helped me once we got rid of it. I understood, okay, now I don't have to worry about that. I can just market and sell and build this brand, and that's really what it, I needed to do. So um, that was a big. Big lesson for me. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is um, Catherine. I'm an MBA student here at Stern. And my question is sort of about your brand architecture because yeah. I've been an honesty consumer for a long time. And Thank I was you. one of the, um, I was a customer who bought like in the glass bottle yeah. from Whole Foods. So that it, was like my classic go to. Yeah. Go -to. But, <laughs> um, but I found it interesting to see the evolution of the distribution and also the brand. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between honest tea in the glass bottle sure. and then honest tea that you find in a plastic bottle yeah. in like a local bodega and like yeah. the difference between like the customer you're trying to reach yeah. and the brand. So it also goes to distribution as well. It's mm -hmm. informed by that. So we started in glass bottles. That was our first pitch to Whole Foods and that's what we sold there and that's what we established and that's what is still the best selling tea in the natural foods channel. And then our question was, um, 
as we started to reach distributors like uh, our distributor here in New York, Big Geyser, we said, we've got this product, we, you know, we think it'll sell. And they said, we think it'll sell too, but we don't like um, competing. We'd like to have a, a market exclusivity. We don't want to have to go and compete against the natural foods distributors. And um, we also started to realize that the glass bottle, which appealed, which looks like a Snapple bottle, right? So it is the Snapple mold. Um, in the natural foods channel, customers can see that and read the, their, they read labels, they get to understand it's a different product. If you put that same bottle in a convenience store or a bodega in New York City, someone's like, oh, this is like Snapple. And then they drink it like, oh, this is, what, you know, why? Where's all the sugar? Um, so we needed to, a package that was able to make sure they could understand it wasn't Snapple. Uh, and so the marketing and communications. And then as we started to do that, we realized, and that's where our growth really started to take off. Glass for natural, plastic for other channels. And each, each distributor felt like they had their own line. And what we've done is we've kept the glass to be more artisanal uh, and generally less sweet. When we bring a product out that no one knows about, like Tulsi, we'll put it in glass and then let it sort of evolve naturally. Um, and so uh, we are probably about six months away from actually having a, a, a new plastic bottle. This bottle, which was innovative at the time, now is fairly generic and we were just finalizing a new design. So um, it's about making the product ownable to each channel. Hi, I'm uh, Trevor, and I'm part of an initiative to help consumers buy local, green, organic, fair trade, slave free. Good. Um, and one of our first steps is influencing the university yeah. and particularly NYU Aramark and dining services. Uh, so since you have experience in yeah. uh, influencing universities. Not much success, but I do have experience. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> with you know, maybe some of the best practices of uh, you've yeah. seen students do. Yeah. Like, what, what can students do to influence the university dining So services? students actually have a tremendous amount of power. I, I'm not trying to, you know, just uh, kiss up here, but it really is. A student, you are the customers. And I always, I've always been frustrated when someone tells me they have a contract that prohibits them. I'm like, well, you're the customer. You're paying, and your parents, in some cases, are paying real money for you to be here to consume these things. You should be able to uh, be able to get what you have access to what you want. And so we often, when we get calls from, whether it's from large stores or restaurants or dining services, it's like, hey, we got a bunch of students who are, and you know, they, the folks who manage these know they get evaluated in part on how much they're meeting the customer needs. So um, it's better when it's not just you, if, if you can sort of demonstrate broad-based support. And then it's also important that when you get something you've been pushing for comes in, you really respond. So, oh, we got local produce here. No one bought any of it. Well, that's not good. That doesn't help your ability to get the next thing. So it's not just to get it in. It's to get it in and make sure it you know, succeeds. And then that makes the, the dining services manager look like a star. Oh, well, I did this and they really liked it. It's yeah. growing. And it's, so um, I, I think that it, it, you have to don't underestimate the power you have, not just here, anywhere, as, as a consumer. Good luck. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Nina. I'm an undergrad at the Silver School of Social Work. And uh, I was wondering, as you had mentioned before, your relationship with Coca-Cola has increased your demand. And I was wondering how, um, if you had encountered any challenges to, uh, to maintain your sustainable approach with the communities who supply the tea leaves um, in a smaller, you know, you know, it's like yeah. a smaller supply chain. And I was wondering how you're utilizing that to? So far we haven't. I mean, we started, um, fortunately when we, the first organic tea in 1999, and it took us five years to get there. So we, these communities have grown their offerings as we've grown and the number of communities has grown too. So um, it's nice to know we're all sort of going in that right direction where more people are coming uh, and more suppliers too. There was um, a point where sugar, organic sugar got tight um, and so we wanted to make sure that they were developing the supply chain. And now, as we look out, we're already working. In, and, and when we, um, just this year, we converted Honest Kids. We took out all the sugar. We, we sweetened it with organic fruit juice, organic grape juice. In order to do that, we had to get, um, we ended up securing more than half the world's supply of organic white grape juice, um, which was kind of why we had to, uh, we had to fly, it's uh, uh, kosher. We had to fly rabbis to Turkey and to Argentina in order mm. to get, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Anyway, the point was we, we worked with these communities ahead of time to say we're going to be buying this crop and we're going to want more next year. So let's you know, uh, continue to build it out. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Frank Fredericks, and I'm actually, as somebody who cares a lot about social business, had no idea that Honest Tea was a socially responsible company, but just loved the fact that it did give me the jitters. That didn't have to <laughs> That's nice um, so I call myself, jokingly, a, a serial social entrepreneur, and yeah. I'm working on a new project actually in Bangladesh around social business consulting mm. and social enterprising. And one thing that's really stuck out to us in our preliminary research, we're trying to understand the market there and then we want to expand is... It's been easy to do this type of work in that context because the largest funders, investors, are foreign government. So you look at BRAC, you look at Grameen, these are the largest entities, business entities in those communities right. because the money is there. Um, the challenge we've been recognizing, and I love your thoughts on in the American context, is the way our equity um, you know, works here. It's the Walmart versus Costco issue. Yeah. Costco is always trying to sell their social business to investors in money terms, whereas Walmart you know, kicks their ass on the quarter to quarter basis based on the fact that they, you know, are, are um, just make running a machine as efficiently as possible. So sort of love to hear how companies like yours, how people like us can change the greater system when the equity market and everything else still ran the way it is on the large scale. I'm not sure I understand the Costco Walmart piece. What, what are you saying there? What's the difference? So be, the um, companies, you know, are responsible to their shareholders right. to maximize profits, et cetera, right. et cetera. So when the CEO of Costco um, talks about how he pays, he pays his staff more. $50 right, right, an right. hour, yeah. he sells it in financial terms, yeah. not in responsible terms. When I was raising money for Honest Tea, um, I did try to raise it from the social investment community. Uh, I raised about $50,000 from that group. Um, over the 10 years that we uh, built the business, we raised $10 million. So basically, I didn't sell this as a social investment. I had to go sell this as this is a great business opportunity, a great investment opportunity. And we're doing all these social things, but we're doing it because we know this can make a great business. So I actually think, um, and I, I would say, you know, the Costco folks will say it's, a good, it's good business to have uh, a loyal uh, and, and, and knowledgeable and experienced labor force not just, it's good business to pay more. It's good business to do, you know, to make those investments. And so um, for us, you know, and I, fortunately now we're at a place where we can say this was a good investment. You know, we know it was. So, so it's, um, it has to be a good investment. And it, it we're just, not to go off too much on a tangent, but there's these B Corps that are being created, which are, uh, you know, in a lot of ways positive. My only worry with it is when people somehow say the B Corp gives you license to not deliver to your investors. Mm. Um, the way other investors might expect. It can't be an excuse for, for not making it a good investment. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Michael Cobble, uh, international business student at SCPS here at NYU. Uh, I was just curious when you were um, expanding into India and China and choosing your tea plantations and farms, um, did you already kind of have a social network built in America that connected you from point A to point B with them? Yeah. Or did you just kind of fly over there and go on this kind of excursion and yeah. et cetera? So and initially, did you need a difficult? Initially, when we were buying tea leaves, it was literally on, online. We went to like UptonTeaImports.com and, you know, um, to like the tea shop in, uh, that we liked in, in Cambridge and said, this, they got nice tea, let's buy it, a lot of it. <laughs> and then we started getting to larger companies. And then eventually, um, we started buying through a, a German importer, German broker. And then as, as that kept growing, we started um, connecting with the communities themselves. Not necessarily the people running the tea gardens, but they would have some like a, a sister-in-law who works in the United States who represented that community. And, and then we connected to those communities. So it was with our scale that we started to get more of those connections. Um, and the more we got to know them, in certain cases, the more we wanted to invest further. So we have relationships now, but it wasn't like anything we started with. Right. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Seth. You're, you're obviously uh, you know, one of the good guys, not just in the, <laughs> in the BEV business, but in business business. Thank you. And uh, you know, I, sort of, I, I feel good that, you know, that at night like, you worry about stuff you do. <laughs> Because I think you should. I don't think my it. wife appreciates that. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't wake her up during the night. <laughs> I try not to. So, but my question is, I mean, you mentioned earlier that you're trying to crack that national restaurant chain thing. And I'm wondering, I mean, does it, does it concern you that, that you're going to sort of be next to, you're going to get in bed with the crap food business? Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that's like the Pizza Huts or... Wendy's or or the higher or the or the better crap food business is like, you know, like, 
you know, Fridays or yeah. I mean, because you, aren't you, you don't you feel like you you judged by the company you keep, and it's not like a supermarket. Say that you're you're in there with ten thousand other products, yeah. and, and you know you can hide behind the milk. Yeah. But here, if if you're if you're in you know Pizza Hut, you, I mean this is, yep, obviously a, a business that you know that is, is trying to slowly kill people. So how do you how do you live? With that? <laughs> I I wouldn't say they're intentionally trying to do that. That's probably a bad business. It's just strategy, really the but result. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> so so one of the things that we talk about all the time, and the reason we call the book Mission in a Bottle is because we say every time we sell a product, it's the, the equity, the, the, the lower calorie, organic, and fair trade pieces are in the bottle. It's not like someone can take this and say, we're going to sell this, we're just going to sell it sweeter, or we're going to sell it with cheaper ingredients, or the, you know, where the, the premiums don't go back to the community. So, so we start from the assumption that our mission is in our package. It can't be compromised. So then the question is, is it compromised by who it's sold alongside of? That's you know, sort of what you're asking. My point of view is these large restaurants, and we can all say what we want about them, they're not going away. This is where hundreds of millions of people eat every day. It's where they get their food. And so my point of view is we need to be wherever people are drinking beverages. Because if they're not drinking our beverages, they're drinking beverages that go right along with some of the unsavory sure. items. So we have, um, I don't want to sound you know, uh, mercenary about it, but we want to be wherever those, wherever we can be. We're, and we talk about democratizing organics. It can't just be the people who go to Whole Foods that have access to healthy drinks. We want somebody who's buying a, a greasy burger and fatty fries to be able to, oh my God, I, I, and they're drinking a low calorie organic tea, fair trade tea. They never would think about that. Yeah, you're the angel at the table, huh? We're just trying to, we're trying to, we're really, if we're going to change the diet, if we're going back to what I said about 40th and life expectancy, we've got to be everywhere. Right. Those where you have the opportunity to be. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So this is the last, last question. question. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ayush. I'm a freshman undergraduate student at Stern. I also happen to be in Professor Roadbar's Understanding Social Entrepreneurship class this semester. Um, the question I wanted to ask is quite rooted in my personal experience for working with um, Unilever. Mm. Um, I bring this up all, all the time in class, but. So I see Unilever as one of the prime examples of social responsibility today. And one thing that really stuck with me with working with them is the idea of the sustainable living plan they happen to have um, that sort of at the heart of all their decisions, they put this map where they graph these lines of how they want the business to grow, how they want their ecological footprint to be, and how they want their social impact on business to be. My question, sort of like going outside of your role as part of honesty, and it goes very hand in hand, I think, with the question that this, the gentleman here proposed, is what's your sort of vision or mission, I guess? Do, do you see those lines still existing in the future as three separate sort of things, or do you want them in the future to, hmm. instead of like all these buzzwords and hmm. innovation, sustainability, happening to go hand in hand with right growing the business, do you, do you happen yeah. to see it all as rather than three separate lines on a graph, do you see it as one? I hope, I hope they all converge. I mean, for us, we, we're very excited about the fact that Honesty is, is now, 15 years later, a profitable, fast-growing, mission-driven business. We're sort of checking off all of them. And, and it's not, we're not, uh, you can't separate it. It's not, you know, we're not profitable. We wouldn't be profitable unless we had our mission. And we wouldn't have our mission, we wouldn't realize our mission unless we were a growing business. And we wouldn't really be impactful unless we were growing to scale. So, so to me, that, that's the, when we can think about business, all business, moving in that direction, that becomes transformational to our society that when businesses think about where the opportunities are, it's not just where's the profit, it's where's the change. And if the change converges with where the profit is, that's magical. Then all of a sudden, we really do transform. And, it, and it's not a government-imposed solution. It's, 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 I was going to say it's not market, it's a market-imposed one, but it's consumer-imposed. It's when consumers can say, this is the direction we want companies to go, and this is what we're going to pay for to do it. And, and so if I can just yeah. quickly follow up, like if, if that is your view, then have you had certain like direct conversations in terms of leadership at Coke, in terms of so the, um, what they think? I that? wouldn't want to overstate it, but the best 
conversation I have is every day when we sell honest tea and we make the case for this business model. You know, our, the, you know I, I often get drawn into conversations around sustainability and nutrition and I'm happy to participate in those, but I know the single most effective way I can change what happens at Coca-Cola or change what happens at Corporate America is making honest tea a powerful business as with, you know, with the equities that we've developed, you know, not to sort of, okay, we're gonna sweeten it and dumb it down and then we're gonna grow. We're gonna do it the way we've been doing it. And when we can do that powerfully, then we can make change happen. Thank you. Great, Great. well, that's it. Thank you so much, Seth, for your time. And thank you guys for, for coming. Great.